Hey everybody, it's Triple Hell here to talk about My Hero Academia chapter 429. I've been trying to read this off of the Viz site. But hey everybody, welcome. And this is it. We're pretty close to the end here. Oh my goodness. Um, exciting, also very exciting chapter, honestly. If you watched the last video, you know that I was kind of thinking like bros. I feel like this is ending with Izuku grabbing that villain by the hand. To my surprise, we have um, it happening in the chapter and redeeming probably the worst villain of all of Hero Academia, that little old granny that just won't die. You know, honestly, did not see it coming. I know uh, commenter White Despair said that people were predicting that. I wasn't really predicting that. I, I figured out why I wasn't thinking about it and why I was so fixated on Izuku. But let's just go to that final page. You'll be just fine because granny is here to help. Granny is here. Hi, Coco. Anyway. Yeah, I, if you recall in the last video, I was saying that Horikoshi really cares more about the world than he does the characters himself. And as an aside, that's the kind of stuff that usually makes me feel like we could be getting a part two or a sequel series. Maybe not following Izuku, but like in general. And so when I think about that and I look at this, this whole thing about the granny coming in here to help and also fixing that issue that she caused with Shigaraki, this is pretty much like the biggest example of Horikoshi cares more about the world than the characters themselves instead of having Izuku reach out and do this instead of having even Ochako reach out and do this because Ochako is also very strongly along the same trajectory as, as Izuku you have the world itself prove that it's getting better although again I need to see the future because this kind of stuff it changes um, but this is like the biggest example of that idea of he cares more about the world and Izuku here, he gets to witness it, so he gets to see that the world is changing, but he's not personally doing it. Um, for me, you see where my bias is. My bias is on the main character. I wouldn't be making a statement about the world like this personally. I'm not saying that's bad for Horikoshi to do that. I gotta say that very quickly because I know some people might get defensive. I'm not saying that's bad to do it. It's just like this is a very different approach. This isn't like this isn't um, this isn't super common in. I want to be very careful saying this. Because I know that there are manga that make a bigger statement about the world. And there, there are specific genres that making statements about the world and treating the world as a character that's growing itself, um, that works more in. But I'm just going to say, out of the battle Shonen and Shonen Jump, this is very unusual. This is a very unusual ending. You don't have that kind of stuff happening in, Sh in Shokage no Soma. You don't have that kind of stuff happening, happening in Naruto. You don't have that kind of stuff happening in Bleach. Um, you might have it happen in One Piece, but not really, because it's more that one's so strongly Luffy's story that there's really only going to be a few things One Piece can actually do. But this is like a very powerful statement about the world. I didn't see it coming. I think well played on Horikoshi here. I think it takes a lot of balls to be able to take a step back from your characters and be able to give the glory to a random old lady. I think that's a very ballsy move in general. Um, and it's not uh, it's it's not a typical thought that one would have. Although this kind of thinking also like it's so odd that it makes me believe there is a sequel series. And I know we got news that there's going to be more announcements about My Hero Academia projects. Um, I don't know. What we really got to ask now is like, what is 430 going to be? Because I thought this moment with the we only had like a few things set up, uh, telegraph that we were going to be getting. The villains and their talks were coming, and we had this guy popping in. So what can 430 be? If this chapter didn't happen, I would have thought 430 would have been in the real time. But now maybe maybe 430 will be half real time, half in the future. Maybe we'll jump a few years into the future. Maybe we'll see what Izuku's life looks like in the future. Will he be wearing a police outfit? Man, if Hero Academia is a story of how Izuku came to realize that being a police officer was just as noble a profession, that will be wild. But yeah, it's going to be really interesting. I don't know. I feel kind of scared to even like try and guess. I think that there's going to be a sequel series. So, it can't be that far in the future. And you know what? I, I still think it's weird that we haven't seen Garaki or Mr. Compress. Like, there's... I feel like it would be extremely mean to leave this series without talking to Mr. Compress at least or something. You know? It's just like, I feel there's still characters that we haven't really covered. It makes me think that we're going to be in real time for the next chapter, but you know what? I'm ready for anything. Hi, Coco. I'm ready for anything at this point. Oh, I love you too, Mr. Coco. I don't know if you guys heard that, but he likes me. All right. Um, yeah. By the way, you might notice that the birds are behind me, and that's because at Casa the Trip, we are always innovating. 
and today's innovation is putting them behind me to see if that alleviates the separation anxiety. Hello Coco. Man, it is so nice to see Shinzo being part of this group. And that scar on Bakugo is ugly, man. To say nothing of Izuku's scars. Poor guy getting made fun of for all his like brain trauma, like come on. Anyway, so cool that we're here. I can't wait to find out what the follow-up projects are. Let's get into the chapter. Okay, so the chapter begins with giving us the answers to what exactly was happening when we saw this guy the first time a few chapters ago. You know, th some things are consistent. Thankfully, we saw that last time he was cutting something with scissors. As it turned out, he was cutting his mouth to free it from being sewn together. That, you know, like, it really felt very Tokyo ghoulish at that point. Anyway, in this chapter, we find out that uh, he was a mutation. And out of nowhere, his whole family, grandma and grandpa and great grandpa included, stopped being nice to him, locked him up in the basement. And uh, then they showed his mouth shut when he was being too loud. Honestly, it gives me the vibes of a story that I was forced to read in high school about a girl who had a sister locked up in the basement that was treated like a monster. If you guys know the name of the story, like, let me know down below. I could also Google it later, but it's a, I think it's a relatively old now. Anyway, I, I really want to think these guys are religious zealots, but you never really know. Anyway, these guys freaked out when the country was doomed. They tossed him a bunch of water and baked goods and they got out of there. Interesting. At least they tossed him that. So, this was just setting up a really nasty situation. And it's, I guess it's kind of interesting that it draws elements in from both Tenko and Eddie. I, I guess that's like an interesting observation to like look at. Okay, so after that, we just have this whole thing about the kid seeing the world. I guess we should show his face, because it's a pretty freaky face. Yeah, it's a pretty freaky face. Anyway, we see this kid here. Um, a lot of big Shigaraki vibes. And after that, we go into the whole thing with Toga and Ochako and Izuku coming in to talk to her. So what I will really support here when I'm looking at this is that I think um, Horikoshi did a really good job in pointing out Ochako's character. 100% Izuku would know this girl is putting on a brave face and crying in the background because he's 100% seen this all the times before. So this is a very organic thing, and it really pays off all these interactions that these characters have had. This is a very in-character moment, um, and it comes about very naturally. And I do like the way that Ochako is failing to hide her face. I think that is very appropriate for who this character is. Um, but overall, Izuku had some really good lines this time around. And I really like the whole, you're my hero line. Now, we talk about this because this is primarily a shipping channel. We love shipping. Like, we love seeing fictional characters date. Um, I'm worried for Uchako because if Izuku calls you his hero, I feel like this is a situation where Izuku could end up putting Uchako on such a pedestal that he will never act on impure feelings such as love for her or romantic love. Um, I'm really worried for this girl's chances. I really hope, really hope that... <laughs> I can't wait to see what's gonna happen. I know other people are talking about they're gonna be a freak out in the community But it's like come on. There's always a freak out people are really invested in this I want to see what happens, but um, we don't really get anything here other than Izuku reaffirming that she's pretty special in his life But honestly, I'd be very I'd be very concerned with Izuku because his hero worship might be so powerful that it prevents him from seeing the very obvious feeling in, in front of him, right? He's a very awkward kid. So let's just appreciate and celebrate this amazing shot of Ojako. Like man, these panels have been beautiful in all honesty um, and note that she's holding on to Izuku's hands with all of her fingers um, now that was a really good attention to detail anyway these pages just really cover Izuku and Ochako Ochako talking about how guilty she is about Toga I still think Toga's alive maybe that'll be revealed in the final chapter I don't know but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for it anyway let's do another appreciation thing where we appreciate the fact that Izuku is in fact floating really good uh, move on Horikoshi's part um, and then we have the whole thing here uh, another small moment is that Ochako cancels her power right as Izuku is about to float away I and mean, then we also see the embers I am still hoping that All Might's Vestige is in there and it's going to help Izuku so he at least has some level of superpower that'd be really good overall anyway as we find out Bakugo gives out the thing about the embers everyone freaks out and a uh, commenter White Despair pointed out that it's interesting how Ochako's having a moment and then all of a sudden we're going back to Izuku and then we go into narrations about what's going on here um, I really think that is indicative of the rush that's going on. Uh, the final chapters were always going to be rushed. Um, and in this point, we're just 
we're just kind of very quickly going through the motions doing summary. I do wonder if the volume extras will be different or the volumes will be different, but what can you do? This is like the nature of an ending, especially with an author that actually does not know how to pace himself. Uh, we, we know it. We know how, how Horiko she is. We know what he said in the past about where he thought Hero Academia was going to end, right? We know he doesn't know how to actually um, predict how much time it's going to take him to do something. Anyway, let's go to the bottom of the page. Down here, it's just worth pointing out Aoyama's party. And we have good old Monoma getting a statue. I actually think he deserves it. Good for him. Then we have this party sequences. I think this is probably one of the cutest things ever. I love that Eri is rocking out here. Um, I do have a question for you guys. I wonder who's, uh, whose grave is this? And that's what I'm trying to figure out. And because of the meat sticks, it was probably Hawks that left it there. I'm just trying to figure out who exactly died. Is this like twice his grave or something? Like I don't even know if he would have a grave. I just I just wonder if anyone has an idea. I just can't think of which character um, Hawks could be putting that down for that's significant for another panel that we're about to get here. Anyway, on this page, one of the important things is that All Might is talking about broadening the scope of the Billboard chart just to appreciate everyday heroes. And man, the more I think about that Horikoshi interview about an everyday hero, it's like, yeah, I feel like if there's one thing that says that we might be seeing a flash forward in the next chapter, it's that there is this presence of this new updated billboard chart. Anyway, I think that'd be cool. It'd be interesting if Izuku's a police officer at the top of that chart at the end of the series, because then it's giving him something, right? But it's also very foreboding. Anyway. Now, this page does have some complex thoughts going into it, and a lot of it does come from Hawks. One sec, I'm trying to get to the bottom. So we have this conversation about leaning away from the popularity system. Um, and Hawks points out that the popularity system, or like the way it currently works, is important. He, makes, he used the phrase, don't toss the baby out with the bathwater. And what he's pretty much saying is that the current system allowed Endeavor to be someone that Hawks could see. So he wants to make sure that certain heroes are still visible even if they're not popular. Um, and like the, the conversations are I think easier to follow in the fan translations, but like if you look at the context clues from like All Might, he's talking about moving away from popularity. Um, I guess that would even help Endeavor more, but popularity is just very important in general just for visibility, I think. Anyway, whatever. It's an interesting conversation, and it just pretty much says that Hawks is going for the new ones. Anyway, Hawks moves into the thing about, like, we have to celebrate everyone that can help everyone. Um, this is how we create a situation where you have a greater number of heroes. Um, and I actually like it. It's, it's going back to just celebrating regular civil servants. I think this is just a very good idea. And it's eerie how this comes back to All Might saying that being a policeman is a noble profession. Anyway, we go back to our buddy here who's suffering asking why he's suffering so much we have a uh, happy people in the background we see that he's activating his quirk i made a joke that because this quirk is producing black stuff it could be like a blot out quirk where it just blots out the world and because it's a manga it actually is pretty dangerous to get blotted out like that so he it's like it's like the cave but in another way right it's what i'm guessing the quirk is i don't think it matters though anyway in the final in the final scenes um, the old lady pays lip service to Izuku, talks about her role in the whole situation, or like, just, you know, she wonders what her choice ended up doing to that little boy that was Tenko. Um, and this is one of those points where I will say, I think it would have been better if All for One was very clear about what happened on that day. And the reason that's important is because All for One, in the final moments, his big reveal to Shigaraki is that he orchestrated a lot. A lot, a lot. Um, heck, he even went out of his way to talk to Shigaraki's friends, right? When you have that, le that level of maniacal control, and then you have the most critical moment, that being Tenko walking around by himself, why do you make no comment about that? And look, man, this ain't, this ain't even about having like really clever readers, because we know the majority of Hero Academia readers are not clever. We know the majority of them forget plot points. We know this. You go to like Reddit, you'll find enough examples, but not you guys, because you guys watch YouTube videos, which usually means you're more clued in on things. But the point is, and from the way Horikoshi writes, 100% people forget plot details, because this guy has to remind people all the time. When it came to that plot detail, it goes one of two ways. If he took control of the situation that day and amplified people's fear, then that is worthwhile. That shows how far All for One would go for this kind of shit. But 
If you go the other way and say all for one didn't do a single thing on the day that uh, Shigaraki was wandering around because he bet on people's apathy or their des or you know their lack of desire to help a creepy kid out, that would be an amazing thing to say about society. That adding that in when you already go out of your way to show how much all for one is responsible for it, it doesn't take away from the manga. It only enhances it. It makes it like that's actually a really chilling point if he says, "Yo, bro, I controlled a lot, but not this. This is all them." That makes it feel like shit. Shigaraki. Whoa, you know, like there was a, a layer of some mis. There was a layer of a bad society here that got involved. And in the other direction, if you say that all for one did take control of it, you get shit. Shigaraki, your whole life really is a gigantic lie. The thing that really set you off wasn't even their fault. You're attacking like true victims that maybe if All For One wasn't involved, they would have helped you. Um, either way, in one direction you get an amazing tragedy, and in another direction you get an amazing statement about the world at that point in time. Um, and it's just very conclusive. You don't leave it up into the air. Uh, it just would have been very interesting. I think if we're looking at something that would have greatly enhanced the overall like background and um, really layered it up, it would have been really interesting. At this point though, you know, in terms of like how I read it, I'm, I'm assuming that All For One had nothing to do with that day, but I really do feel like it's a missed opportunity. All For One could have had a great speech coming off of that. I, I wonder if Horikoshi had any thoughts about that. If, yo, if he comes out in a volume extra and reveals that All For One actually manipulated people's feelings that day in a volume extra, then 100% I'm going to criticize it. I'm not a fan of when like he puts critical details into volume extras. I like that he does it because we find out in general. But I don't like what it does to the regular discourse, and I don't think this is good storytelling. Like, that kind of critical detail should not be in a volume extra. So, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed it doesn't end up there, but if it does end up there, then it, retroactively, this becomes very bad. Altogether, I think it would become very bad. Just in terms of quality. Like, in my final, like, critical review quality, you know? But it doesn't really matter in the long run, unless you're, like, a super fan. And, you know, when I say it doesn't really matter in the long run, I really mean, like that little detail isn't going to really change Hero Academia sales. It's just going to make something cool to talk about, which just keeps fandom alive for a little bit longer. But like, it, it really doesn't affect uh, sales in the long term. Actually, you know, if you want to talk about sales, I really do feel that a lot of Hero Academia's choices, even the ones that usually cause uproar, are probably... Those kind of choices are probably the ones that promote more sales in Hero Academia in general. Anyway, we have the whole thing. Um, Hawks, we end off on the line of he of Hawks. It's his heroic ideal that is framing the chapter. A world where heroes have time to kill. Very interesting, right? Um, the reason it's interesting is because like Hawks comes in with a very particular kind of philosophy. Hawks doesn't care too much about villains. The ones that care about villains are um, Izuku and Ochako. So it's interesting to end it off there. And I mean, you can play the mental games of like, well, if you have a world where you have time to kill, that means it's because everyone is helping each other out more, which ultimately means, yeah, that like Izuku and Ochako's way of thinking that being being kind to villains is um, being more pronounced. Except it's not. Because the problem that we have here, we're going actually towards more towards Ochako in terms of the in terms of the paradigm, where it's like the idea of if Ochako had talked to Hey Coco, sorry, I ignored you. Anyway. The Ochako, so we're going back more into the Ochako situation, where if she had met Toga when she was a little girl, she could have prevented everything. So the reason this is important, if we're actually getting into it, like the framing is is Hawks. His metaphor is the one that's ultimately winning out at the end of the day. It's the one that's leaving an impression in the reader's mind. But that met, like his thing about heroes having time to kill actually does not say anything about helping a villain that's already in the throes of villainy. Because right now, Everything about the chapter, everything that Ochako is crying about, is all pointed at stopping a villain before they happen. So what do we do with the villains that are already formed? That question is actually not answered anywhere in this final chapter. It's all about the prevention of the villains. Um, so this is a bit of a... It's a bit of a blind spot if you look at the structure of Hero Academia, or if you look at like the state of the current society. And it's actually really interesting too, because... When you come into the epilogue chapters, the epilogue chapters are specifically all about what if right now there is another all-for-one Shigaraki about to be born. Everyone's talking about like in this state of chaos, another all-for-one could come out of it, right? We're all in this position of waiting for this next arrival to come. And it's this boy that we have on the screen, 
right here. He is the symbol of that storyline. So really, when you step away from Hero Academia, look at those final five chapters and realize these guys aren't talking about saving someone like Muscular. At best, maybe you have Shizaki, but Shizaki's already been neutered. Shizaki can't do anything. Um, but yeah, no, it's really interesting when you look at it. Everything about these chapters is about prevention and not saving the ones who are already messed up. It's actually really interesting how solidly of a theme Horikoshi developed in the five chapters and how he's kept it so focused on that. Uh, but yeah, um, interesting that here we are. Um, now, if you were talking about like the other moral that kind of competes with the heroes will have time to kill, it's really just the whole thing of like seeing villains as, you know, uh, a product of a long chain of events and seeing them still as their, seeing their humanity in them. Izuku is the one that carries that storyline more, and I think that is more prominent in the spinner side. So I know I just said, you know, really look at these chapters and see where exactly the theme is. But yeah, Izuku is the one that's running counter to it. And you'd only see it in Izuku's interactions with Spinner, where you're specifically seeing some kind of thing about helping the villains who have already been screwed over significantly. Then that does invite the question of what the nature of the final chapter is going to be if we're going to see a return to Izuku's way of thinking. Any hoosers. Good stuff. Um, overall, I really enjoyed the chapter. I think it has a lot of really cool ideas. Very surprising execution on this final villain. Um, actually... Probably, you know what, ever since Spinner showed up, I think the, the chapters have been better. I would, I think this is my favorite of the final epilogue chapters. Guys, let me know what you thought down below. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and uh, till next time, I hope you have an absolutely great day. Say bye guys. They haven't learned how to say that, but believe me, one, one day they will.